Okay, so next we're going to actually talk about the timing of androgen deprivation therapy and chemotherapy. And basically, I had a couple of questions. Chemotherapy and the management of advanced prostate cancer is more effective in the castrate-sensitive or castrate-resistant setting? Okay, well, interesting. Next question. Cisplatin is typically more effective than docetaxel when treating advanced prostate cancer. True or false? Okay, good. You know. All right. Chemotherapy, i.e. docetaxel, may be a better option than a secondary hormonal option for patients who have the ARV7 mutation. True or false? Very good. And visceral metastatic prostate prostate cancer has a better prognosis than small volume bone metastatic involvement. Okay, good. All right, I go to the talk, please. So ADT therapy, largely with LHRH agonists, is currently the standard of care in the management of newly diagnosed prostate cancer patients. Whether you combine it with an, with an antiandrogen or not, it induces PSA responses, but inevitably castration-resistant disease appears at an average of 18 to 24 months. Chemotherapy is typically considered as a last resort, or was up until recently, when there were a number of trials which suggested that it played a role earlier in the disease. The use of chemotherapy in prostate cancer really came from two studies. One was the SWOG study, the second was the TAX-327 trial. The SWOG study identified the fact that we didn't need estromustine, but both of them showed that docetaxel, given at a dose of 75 milligrams per meter squared every three weeks, was the most effective treatment. But typically, up until recently, it's been a last resort. If we look at this slide, it's basically the evolving treatment paradigm in prostate cancer. You see that there's been a major change since 2004 when docetaxel was first uh, was. was first put on as a, as a viable treatment, and all of these other things came behind. Fact is, though, it's been changing and changing rapidly over the last three to four years, and it's wonderful to see it, and I think the whole face of treating prostate cancer is changing very quickly. But the question still remains, can we do better while patients are still castration sensitive? Because that's the area that I think the disease is more susceptible to the therapies that we give. And here you see once again a list of the therapies. And if you look here, chemo has been moved up on that list. There's other changes that have occurred. We've heard about the antagonist versus the agonist. And we've also seen that taxotir has now been moved to the castrate sensitive state. And there may be more moves afoot. Just, I'm not going to go through this again, but the Degorelix monotherapy there was actually a very good paper by Peter Iverson, which was published in 2016, which was of two randomized control trials of docetaxel. It was basically the original CS21, and then also the trial that was done with the three-month docetaxel, which, as I mentioned before, was only 89% effective, so therefore didn't get approved, but there was a lot of patients that we could look at. So the data from 1,455 patients pooled from these two trials evaluated Degorelix versus an LHRH antagonist, and you could see PSA progression-free survival was calculated and compared, and baseline characteristics did differ somewhat between the groups, but there was case control analysis with a conditional, conditional logistic regression analysis. And what it showed was, in the case controlled analysis, patients receiving the Degorelix versus the LHRH agonist plus the antiandrogen did better the patients on the Degorelix. So the question now becomes, is there a role for docetaxel in the castrate-sensitive prostate cancer patient? And we have two excellent trials. One was the Charter, and the other was the Stampede. And they basically, Charter had 790 patients. We all know the data. If we look at it, it was stratified for both low and high-risk patients. And when the results came in, they started off originally with 568 patients, but it rapidly increased to 780 to include more low-risk patients. And what they found was there was a substantial nearly 14 months difference in the trial overall for overall survival. That's going with everybody. Most of this benefit was seen in the high-risk patients 
versus the low risk patients. Okay, that was the first thing, the first sign that we had, it created a, quite a stir. Everybody was suddenly, man, we need to go with chemotherapy early. Now there was some concern because there was a second trial, the GETAC 15 trial, which I will mention in a second. But these findings were confirmed by the STAMPEDE trial. And STAMPEDE is a unique trial. It's a very ambitious, randomized, multi-arm, multi-stage design to analyze a variety of different therapeutic interventions. And the control group remains the same for each of the interventions because they're all being, it's being done simultaneously, if you like. There's the same control group. And basically what it showed was, again, that the use of chemotherapy in the castrate-sensitive patients was effective. Now, they had some patients who were not even metastatic disease at this point. So the published data summarized a pre-planning subset analysis of metastatic patients, which showed a statistically significant increase in median survival of the M1 patients who were on the chemo plus ADT. And it was 60 months versus 45 months. I mentioned the Gettuck trial from France, which was published around the same time, and which, while it did show a difference in biochemical progression-free survival, it showed no overall survival. And that led to a question. And I remember being out at a meeting, and I bumped into my very good friend, Evan Yu. And Evan likes to have a pint, and so do I. So we adjourned to have a pint. And during it, this conversation came up. And this slide is Evan's, and he gave it to me. But basically, he looked at Chartered versus the Getic 15. And as you can see, there's a number of differences which immediately become apparent. Discontinuation for early toxicity was considerably more in Getuk. There were different numbers of patients. There was 385 in the Getuk versus 790 in the charter. Docetaxel cycles, roughly the same, slightly more in Getuk. Gleason 8, yeah, reasonable in both, but more in chartered. PSA median was different. And treatment-related deaths were almost back to the tax 327 in, in the Getuk, slightly different in the chartered. So after we looked at this, we went back and found there is a study size and statistical power difference. There's prognosis and disease risk volume differences. Staging criteria were different, and there was no standardized def definition for low versus high volume metastatic disease. And I've been talking about that for the last year, but we really do need to somehow standardize what we call low risk and what we call high risk metastatic disease. And the toxicity was different between the two of them. So if you look at TAX327, GETUC15, and Chartered, you can see here neutropenia was almost the same in the GETUC study as it, wa it was the same as the TAX327. Febrile neutropenia, again, there was a lot in the GETUC15. And deaths, there was a lot in the GETUC15. Why was it? Key conclusion, it's tough to interpret this toxicity data with incomplete information on growth factors and prophylactic antibiotics. But there is some sense that docetaxel may surprisingly be more toxic in the hormone-sensitive metastatic patients. Now, why is that? Well, it's not a surprise at all. Because Frankie et al. examined the relative clearance of docetaxel in 10 non-castrated and 20 castrated men with prostate cancer. Docetaxel pharmacokinetics are significantly altered in the castrated men with an approximately 100% increase in docetaxel clearance and accordingly a two-fold reduction in the area under the curve as compared to men who are non-castrate. To, to put it bluntly, the liver kicks it out if you're castrate. If you're not castrate, far more of the docetaxel gets in. Hence, you are likely, and this is basically one of the graphs from that, you're far more likely to see toxicity if you're still castrate sensitive. And a 50% decrease in docetaxel clearance associate, was associated with an over 430% increase in the risk of grade 3 to 4 neutropenia. So there we are sitting in the pub, and now we've had probably three or four pints. And we looked at each other and we said, damn, if the toxicity is greater, might not the efficacy also be? And when we went back and looked, we found that a significant number of the patients in the GETUG study were given their chemotherapy two to three weeks after getting their LH or H agonist. They weren't castrate. So the rationale, what about giving docetaxel before medical castration? 
How's about we take a look at it and see what's the rationale for that? There's three areas you look at, pharmacokinetics, in vitro and in vivo data, and human data. So if we look at the prostate cancer cell lines, that showed increased sensitivity to taxane-mediated cell death in response to androgen stimulation of the androgen receptor. In one series, androgen-dependent LINCAP prostate cancer cells showed a decreased survival when cultured with steroid hormones and paclitaxel as compared to cells depleted of steroid hormones. The mechanism is supposed to be caspase-dependent apoptosis in the presence of P53 activation and cellular proliferation. If we look at LINCAP bearing mice combined with uh, LINCAP bearing severe combined immunodeficient mice, tumor volume and tumor apoptosis were measured in response to castration alone, docetaxel alone, both interventions administered concurrently, and both interventions administered in different sequences. Docetaxel administered prior to castration yielded the longest delay in tumor growth and studied interventions. We moved to the breast cancer data. We found the same thing in women. If they were on tamoxifen, they did not do as well as if they got the docetaxel before they got their tamoxifen. And what about human trials in prostate cancer? Hussain et al. treated 39 men with non-castrate level testosterone and increasing PSA post-definitive therapy for localized prostate cancer. That was a prostatectomy or radiation with up to six cycles of docetaxel at the dose I've already mentioned. Chemotherapy was followed by androgen blockade. Serum PSA decreased over 50% in almost 50% of the men on the docetaxel alone and 75% in 20% of the patients in docetaxel alone. Only one patient had increased PSA at the end of the docetaxel therapy. The majority of patients had PSA progression after stopping their ADT. But interestingly, five of the 33 patients had an undetectable PSA at a median of 18.9 months after stopping ADT. Seven of the men in this study had radiographic evidence of metastatic disease, and three of those were among the long-term survivors. So that has led to a proposal where we've actually gotten a trial funded which looks at a phase two study of docetaxel before medical castration with degorelics in patients with newly diagnosed metastatic prostate cancer. The theory behind it is that we give them the four cycles up front, they will need protection, they will need antibiotics, they will need to be assessed for toxicity. We treat them as necessary with GMCSF, and then they get castrated, and we want something that's going to castrate them quickly. Ergo, we give them docetaxel, and then they get the last two. We've now accrued almost, we have 15 patients to date. We're, it's a phase two, so we're trying to get 50 patients. So in answer to the question, timing of ADT, why would you give ADT at the very end when the patient's at their most sickest? They can't tolerate the dose. So if you're going to give it, we know today we should probably give it at the time that you're going to do ADT. That makes sense when they're still castrate sensitive. But let's move it even forward and make them non-castrate. That's the trial that has to be done because I, I now, having looked at it, that's something I really want to know because if you can get more in, if they're healthier patients, you may see a benefit. We certainly have the evidence preclinically and some early clinical evidence. So I'm not sure what the timing of ADT should be, but I certainly know it probably shouldn't be at the very end of life. And the other question I have is if we're going to start using all the androgen ablative therapies, okay, let's do that. But if we do it, be prepared for early resistance. We all know that if you give abiraterone and the patient breaks through it, enzalutamide isn't going to be as responsive because of the ARV7, and vice versa. You can give whichever one you give first, the second one doesn't work as well. However, we do know they remain sensitive to taxanes, so perhaps it makes sense that if you did fail one of these novel therapies, you should use your chemo there. Before the, and then there is evidence that you may get a reversal of some of the ARV7, and then there will be, there's a couple of small studies which came out of Hopkins, I think, showing that at that stage, you can reintroduce the other, non or the other novel therapy. So that's all I have. We don't know the answer, but I do feel that it's probably earlier rather than later. Thanks very much.